Hello and welcome to the first session of uh, Reza Negrestani's Theory and Object, uh, Philosophy of Science in the 20th Century from Carnap to Grunbaum. Um, this course provides a survey of motivations, trends, and directions in the philosophy of science in the 20th century. <clears throat> During the 12 sessions, we uh, shall engage with both introductory materials and in-depth issues when necessary, in addition to underlining the pertinence of philosophy of science today, we shall focus on trajectories, which specifically engage with the problem of modern philosophy from Hume and Kant to Wittgenstein and Russell. And in doing so, they also point <clears throat> to new problems and conceptual territories hitherto hidden to hidden or ignored by general philosophy. To this end, we'll closely examine the works of such leading figures as Carnap, Hempel, Reichenbach, Stegmuller, Putnam, and Grunbaum. Um, thank you for joining the class, and I will pass the mic to Reza Negrestani now. Thank you very much, Theo, uh, Tan, uh, for participating in this class. Uh, those of you who know my methods and how I teach, uh, I usually, you know, when I say 12 sessions, we usually mean 15 sessions at least. <laughs> uh, so there will be, you know, free sessions, precisely because I know very, for the fact that we cannot simply, even in the most constrained way, talk about philosophy of science in 12 sessions. So, uh, you know, we will, we will take our time, we will, uh, and that means that you need to ask questions, whatever you feel necessary. Do not ever let me go without explaining what you think ought to be explained. Okay? So, in this sense, uh, I would like to make this first session as simple introduction. We're not going to talk about really esoteric technical topics in philosophy of science at this point. I think at this point we should just simply talk a little bit about what actually science is. So with that regard, <clears throat> I would like before I even start so I can get a little bit of indication as how science for you to talk about what you consider science to be. So then I can start the course by way of, uh, you know, um, the early, what you might call to be philosophers of science. I mean, the canonical philosophy of science. I, I understand that philosophy of science has been around for quite a while, even beyond the 20th uh, century ambit. It has been, you know, around since at least 18th century. But the thing is that uh, the, 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 the formulation, the accurate formulation of what philosophy of science is and what it does wasn't really proposed until the 20th century. I think Popper, and I know that probably a lot of you who know Popper think that Popper is an asshole, but I assure you not. Popper is quite a fundamental thinker. Yes, and biased claim. So as scientists, we are just people. And so for that, I beg you to suspend your disbelief or your belief or your prior prejudices when it comes to figures who in content of philosophy, if you are coming from content of philosophy, have been introduced as what you might call to be a rigid kind of philosophers. Popper is usually among, along with Wittgenstein and so on and so forth, have been introduced in content of philosophy circles as extremely rigid people. But I assure you that this is not really the case. This is not the whole of the story these people actually thought quite coherently about both the vocation of philosophy and the vocation of science. So, with that said, let's start 
whoever wants to talk first, tell me what you think science is ultimately. Theo, do you want to start so you can invigorate other people to talk? Uh, it's a hard question. I, <clears throat> uh, I think that maybe I think about it more in a negative way, that science is a way of testing and putting forth hypotheses and testing them um, rather than thinking of it as a sort of positive established set of things that we concretely know. Um, okay. Okay. So I think of it in terms of a negative. So, 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 so you basically think of the status of the science in terms of its negatability which means that it's testability or falsification. Right, which is Popperi type of way of going about science, I suppose. But I, I'm not sure exactly what positive aspects Popper would allow in his system. Okay, this is great. Sepide, I see that you are online. Uh, do you have anything to say on this front? Any other person? Jeff? Yeah, I'll go. Um, sure. Well, I guess how I would think of science is like the attempt to think the world in the most invariant way possible. So without the relativity of whatever perspectives we come to it with as like the real things that we are as the objects we are. So Excellent. whether it's like where cultural objects or uh, a certain kind of animal science is a way of like thinking what's invariant in the world regardless of this initial uh, Adam may, may I challenge you at this point and, and this is not by any means what you might call to be a challenge it's just simply a question that will inform how we will move forward what do you mean by invariant? I would like you to ex explicit uh, the idea of the invariant. Okay. Um, so I guess an invariant feature of something would be something that's preserved across uh, differences and changes. So Excellent. Excellent. In, in mathematics, I guess you could think a certain structure and then and what's invariant uh, about that structure given uh, given the possibility of also shifting that structure. So I guess like invariance is one with change and variance at the same time. So there's no invariance. Yes, yes, yes. Excellent, excellent. Jeff, do you have any uh, comment on this? Uh, yeah, sorry to join the hangout late. First of all, um, I was rude, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> I think that traditionally I've, I've thought of science as kind of some kind of uh, discovery process of like ground level truth. You know, like or uh, the 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 facts that seem to establish or support some kind of notion of truth. So I think. Um, What's transforming for me is is uh, the notion of the varying productions of that truth, how those things are created and uh, produced through various frameworks, uh, given um, methods, different methods, hypotheses, uh, etc. So that's that's. May I ask you, Jeff, uh, when you say truth, uh, I mean, 
you know, a, a lot of people on this, uh, in this class are coming from the content of tradition. Uh, we know that, uh, as I'm sure you know, that uh, there yeah. is a, a kind of aversion. Uh, I don't know whether it's good or bad, but nevertheless, there is an aversion to the idea of canonical truth. So when you say truth, mm -hmm. what do you mean by it? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I mean that in the sense of uh, a, a sort of uh, establishing a baseline of, of knowledge or facts that are used in a particular context or in a given framework or something like that. Objectivity. So that's, exactly. And I think that uh, I'm speaking more in the, um, in the sort of cultural sense, I guess, in how science, you know, when we use the term science or we speak about scientific you know, discovery or investigation or um, it, it always has the, it has the, uh, the sense of some kind of greater authority, let's put it that way. And certainly it's yes. been, it's been sort of used in that sense to try to establish philosophical positions. You know, I'm thinking of the yes. Churchlands, for example, um, who, you know, uh, that are, you know, gain their authority from its sort of, um, you know, its cultural meanings. Yes. Uh, uh, this is just, I, I'm probably a stepping flash forwarding too much, but nevertheless, uh, for, for this occasion, you really think that, and, and this is just out of curiosity, it's not a challenge by any means, do you think that science and philosophy, uh, when it comes, uh, when we are comparing them, philosophy can be subordinated to science or not? And if yes, in what context? Uh, you're asking me personally? Yes. Yeah, uh, no, I would say no. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Excellent, excellent. Any, any more, please, please feel free. I mean, uh, don't be coy. This is just a very casual class. There is no going to be question and answer. There is no reprimand. Just <laughs> say what you think. Maybe, uh, I think JS's mic is working if he wants to. Sure, any, any person. Maybe Hello? also our physicists can talk about something. <laughs> Say I can say something. Absolutely. Uh, I won't be able to say what science is and just like what and sign up and say this is my belief like this. But I cannot think when you ask what science is, for me science is uh, first of all a specific kind of practice. And so I have this pragmatic view on what science is. But then I cannot also actually say that there is a science. For me, there are many different sciences which are connected to different practices. And, uh, and then, of course, uh, each science has its own rules and its own uh, games methods. to play. Yes, methods. Yeah, yes. methods. And then, of course, people were invoking notions of invariance and hypotheses and theories. Uh, you, one of the reasons why I'm in this class, it's like, I want to understand what, like, I, I want to understand, for example, I know what a little bit how physics operates, for example, or mathematics or this kind of uh, hard sciences. And I want to understand what it means to do like this humanitarian sciences, for example, what scientific, what scientific is there? So I'm having this pragmatic view uh, to enter, to, like I'm trying to answer this question from this pragmatic kind of way. Um, uh, so yes, uh, so to say what science is, would be for me, like I have to consider all different sciences and to see the invariance in there and then try to maybe understand what science is as such. <laughs> yes, okay. So basically the idea is that you, you, you somehow think that there is multiplicity of practices and methods, 
But nevertheless, there is a very loose thread that uh, somehow integrate what we might call sciences. And this loose thread is what you might call to be objective art in a Hegelian sense or a Kantian sense. Uh, objectivity as such. Uh, and objectivity can be interpreted in different kinds of ways, uh, by way of invariances, by way of intersubjectivity, by way of logic, so on and so forth. Perhaps I'm not familiar with Hegel's notion of objectivat. Objectivat is simply what you might call to be, you see, <clears throat> since the beginning of the critical philosophy, we have at least two notions of objectivity. One is called a Gegerstand, uh, which is of the sensible object, namely that our senses allow us to somehow gain traction on the causal fabric of the universe by way of our judgments. But these judgments are about sensible things, sensible entities, sensible objects, like this table over there. And then, of course, this table over there might not be actually uh, ultimately the object of our senses, but nevertheless, our senses allow us to gain traction upon it. So we can talk about this table not just in terms of its color and shape, which is manifest, but also in terms of quantum fields, something like that. But then there is something also in Kant, so as Hegel, is called objectivat. Objectivat is what you might call to be objectivity of thought. That the kind of invariances that we project onto the universe so as we can distinguish different features and properties of absolute processes is not coming to us naturally. It's something that we develop. We develop out of our own logic and theorizing and labor of theorization. And that's what objectivat is. Objectivat is simply what you might call to be not the object of sensibility as such, but the object of thinking in the broadest possible sense. And by thinking in the broadest possible sense, I mean the labor of theorization, the labor of distinguishing different kinds of structures in the universe. With the understanding that as Sellers said once, we never know if universe actually has a structure. Because if we were in this position that we could say that the universe actually has an inherent structure, then that would be something what he calls the myth of the given. The myth, the, the word myth in this sense, it simply means an ideological fixation regarding the idea that our knowledge at some point bottoms out to a fundament, and that fundament is already given to us. So we do not need to go further than that. Basically, the sense datum, how we observe things, is simply enough for us to arrive at the Sellers uh, challenges this idea as a dubious ideology, in the sense that our knowledge is never fundamental. Our knowledge is never predicated on an ultimate foundation, which you might call to be the datum, the degree zero datum, sense datum, or so on and so forth. He says that simply the idea is that we need to understand knowledge as a labor of theorization in which our sense datum are being cut up. They are not subordinated to sense datum. Sense datum are in fact, are being cut up in the labor of theorization, computational modeling, logical modeling, mathematical modeling, so on and so forth.
any person who, who wants to say something on this on this front uh, I always thought of science as a practice which uh, creates uh, objects uh, my apologies create what objects uh, create objects okay yes creates uh, what is called uh, nature and something yes, okay. some kinds of objects which can be used uh, independently of and studied independently of or even against uh, specific cultures yes so. yes that's that's a very 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 good definition and and that's also lead us to say that even objects as what you might call to be Kantian sensible objects, the Gegenstand, are not given in advance. They are being constituted by our cognitive theoretical and structural resources. But there is something in this very process that prohibit us to understand the labor of science as if it was simply a byproduct of solipsistic idealism, as if whatever we think about the universe should happen in the universe. No. The thing is that science postulates using our resources, and there are, these resources are fundamentally modifiable and revisable. You see, the whole point, as we will talk about, there is no such a thing science if it was not a revisable endeavor, if its standards could not be modified at a later time. The thing is that we constitute objects, and these objects actually are postulates of our own thoughts in relation with an external reality, of which we have no a priori Theory. But nevertheless, once through the course of science, we postulate objects and thus the concepts of such objects, which are insensitive to our subjective biases, to our psychological prejudices. And this is one of the greatest achievements of science, this enthralling unyoking thinking from psychologism, from the psychology of subject, from human biases, no matter what they are. And there is a reason that usually <clears throat> The Copernican Revolution, the Keplerian Revolution, the Venetian, the Darwinian Scientific Revolution, and later on the Computer Revolution, deliver the most resolute message to the human subject. Objectivity is different from your experience of objects. These are two different things. In fact, if you can ever think about how conditions of human experience can be changed, it can only be through resorting to objectivity rather than the subjective human experience. Questions, heckling, whatever you want. So are you just essentially calling science, you know, like the, the, all of the theoretical resources that we have, like everything which lies within the faculty of the understanding and, and the process of revising them? I wouldn't say that science is essentially a subset of understanding. In the 
science has two is twofold what you might call to be the constitution of the scientific enterprise and what you might call to be the extractions of sensible facts about the universe so the extraction of the sensible facts falls under what you might call to be understanding in a Kantian sense with it but then the constitution of such an enterprise is beyond the scope of understanding in a Kantian sense because understanding as we know in a Kantian parlor uh, or par parlance is, is not really something that you might call the constitutive aspect of how we arrive at such facts it's simply what you might call to be the after the fact enterprise of cognition in the sense that you know we, 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 we look at this table and we say that this table has its shape such and such and its color is thus and so but the very fact that we make such a claim we make such a perceptual judgment is precisely because understanding is itself subsumed within a broader realm and that's what you might call to be the realm of reason or logic logical a structure or mathematical structures are ultimately what inform us how we make such perceptual judgments about matter of factish sensible objects within the universe and this is fundamentally a platonic thesis mathematicals or analytical idealities are ultimately what give us the resources to structure our sensations which we derive from an external reality so science is logic uh, yes and no precisely because when we are talking about science of logic if we, you mean a Hegelian science of logic I think that it's a little bit too bloated with its own metaphysical uh, assumptions but I would just would like to say that it's what you might call to be logics in a plural sense the idea that the structure is a dimension of mind and not reality if we ever mistake these two then we fall victim for what Sellers called the myth of the given. So what is the myth of the given? Sellers has this very famous example. He says that reality, whatever you might be, you know, we do not know what it is really, unless we actually structure it. We don't know, reality is not a molten block of wax in which a structure can be imprinted no the 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 the, the, the connection between mind and its structuring faculties and reality is far from obvious you see the structure of reality is never given if you think it is given then you are not in the business of science. You are in the business of mysticism. Where you have already concluded that there is such and such a structures or fundamental features of reality. But that's not how science works. Science, and that's why we need to understand science as essentially a what you might call to be a um, a critical progression over Kant's transcendental thesis. So what is Kant's transcendental thesis? You see, before Kant's critical turn in philosophy, the dichotomy between reality and mind was so easy. 
such as Descartes. Reality was thought as the datum or the structuring data. And mind was thought as a tabula rasa, as a blank state. So mind is just a blank state and it gets imprinted by the very structure of reality. However, after Kant's critical turn, this was simply garbage. It was trashed once and for all. Mind is no longer a blank state. Mind is in fact the data, the structuring data, and reality is a blank slate. There is no such a thing as a reality without the labor of a structuration, without the labor by which we can postulate that which is intelligible and that which is a structure. So, so could we say then that the reality in itself is pure multiplicity in the way that the Jew would say? Because it seems like what you're saying is that yes, there I wouldn't, is no I wouldn't structure call it multiplicity, reality. Adam. You see, I, I, uh, I, I tend to go with Plato on this front, even though I know that Badiou is fundamentally Platonist, but I don't want to go to this route that I would say is not Platonist enough. Okay, so what is exactly the thesis of Plato? And uh, the thing is that Plato thinks that even multiplicity is an index of a structure, and hence not of reality but of mind, because a structure is the dimension of mind and mind alone. If we postulate that multiplicity was a necessary feature of reality, then we would have actually attributed a minimum level of a structure which Sellars would call a myth of the given, as if it is fundamental. Plato, on the other hand, thinks about multiplicity and the structuring unity in terms of, in his later works, as the, what you might call to be uh, interaction between the infinite dyad and the one. The infinite dyad is what you might call to be the material reality. We do, not, we do not know what it is. It is yet to be determined. And the one is the force of determination or a structuring mind. And even multiplicity, Plato would like to argue, is not an essential feature of reality but it is something that is projected onto reality by the structures of mind, namely science. The very reason that we can talk about multiplicity of objects is precisely because we can, we can constitute different objects using the structuring powers of mind. I have a question. Absolutely. This uh, things that you said, <clears throat> I'd like you to maybe elaborate a little bit on this. Absolutely. The relationship of structure and mind. You say structure is a feature of mind, but what kind of feature is this? Or what else can we it's say? It's a logical feature. It's ultimately a logical fe feature. And by that, when I say logical, and this is something that we will c come when we read Karna, that logic should not be understood in terms of classical logic. We should suspend our belief or misbelief in classical logic. You no, know, classical logic is simply one feature among the ultimate logical infrastructure of mind. A structure is a logical feature. Is something that we project onto reality. By that I mean we do indeed have sensations of how reality affects us, an external reality of which we do not yet know anything. Imagine we are just human version zero or beta. 
at the beginning of time. We don't have yet an idea of what logic is, or what objectivity is, or what reality is. All that we know is that there is a way that this external reality affects us. It's what you might call to be the causal postulate of reality. The reality does affect our senses. And by through which, but these sensations are not structures. These sense datum are not structures by themselves. We will talk about them when we are talking about logical positivism and ultimate failure of Carnap's logical positivism, which I think that if Carnap's, and believe me, Carnap was the god of philosophy, if he spectacularly failed when it, come, when it came to logical positivism in the sense that the sense datum give you already a logical structure, then it means that any form of empiricism will eventually fail. So I <clears throat> tend to go with a Salarzian idea, in the sense that the structure of reality is not revealed to us by sensation. But it is a product of what you might call to be a very complex entanglement between how the logical infrastructure of mind is projected onto sensible data or observational statements. Um, you mentioned how um, science is twofold. On the one hand, you have the uh, extraction of invariance from sensibility. Um, then you have you know, object constitution, theory constitution, world constitution. Um, I'm wondering, you know, um, because it, it seems like that starts to get to uh, combine, you know, the, the negative mood, move of testing also like a positive move of sort of tentative assertions. Um, and you know, what I'm wondering is what would be, what do you think the difference would be between, um, you know, the con say the constitution of scientific knowledge and, you know, the constitution of, um, you know, scientific practice and, and more like, um, uh, you know, practical, craft of, of applying the concepts of science and what would be the the the, the proper uh, d distinguishing of the two yes but you see christian <clears throat> things are never black and white in any field i mean this, that's just a given the thing even is uh, um as we will I mean, and that's really a mission of this whole course. Show that science is all not like philosophy, is not a clear cut position. You see, there are different kinds of way by which postulates of objectivity can be put forward. It is not what you might call to be a universal endeavor in, in, a, in a Kantian sense, as if there was just one unified way we call it science, and it can shed light on the furniture of the universe. No, that's not how it's going to work. In fact, what I'm going to do throughout this course is to show that any way the philosophy of science has ever formulated science as being a clear-cut position, in the sense that you have a canonical set of methods by which you arrive at objectivity, at the furnitures of, at the truth of the furnitures of the world, is not going to work. It's going to be challenged by the proper instruments of philosophy. And what I would like to mention this uh, before we're having the break is that science is essentially a pluralistic endeavor. For it to be pluralistic doesn't mean that it is relativist. We are going to shed light on this idea of pluralism versus relativism. It's not relativistic. 
but nevertheless, it is pluralistic. I was just wondering if you're seeing a like deep relationship between mind and what science is, and if there is a deep relationship between what mind is and what science is. I, I, to be honest with you, Theo, this is something that is still I'm trying to grapple with. But all I can tell you at this point, and this is susceptible to further revision at some point, is that I think that science is what you might call to be refinement of methods of objectivity. I genuinely believe that Thomas Kuhn was right. There is such a thing as a paradigm of science. Not precisely in the sense that he tried to canonize the paradigms of science or the scientific method, but nevertheless, it's what you might call to be most optimal philosophy par excellence, in the sense that philosophers ultimately arrive at a community of a set of optimal methods and optimal investigation with regard to the empirical data and the criterion of testability of our own postulates of thoughts. So just so in that regard, I would say I wouldn't say that science is different from philosophy. I would say the science is the refinement of the philosophical discipline. So just to be clear, I know it might be quite a stretch, but uh, are you basically trying to, I mean, go into Salarzin space of reasons, kind of establish a neutral epistemic domain where no, 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 no. I will actually give a, a very harsh critique of sellers on this okay. front. Okay. It just seems like... precisely, I would... Go on, go on, Artem. Yeah, it, it just so felt like when you were talking about the pluralism, it seems that there was this kind of epistemic allowance for a neutral field that I felt was really kind of drawing... No, no, no. Not, not, not in the sense of neutrality, Artem. What I would okay. say methodological pluralism ultimately is, is that you might think about it in terms of a patchwork. You see that there is this planet Earth, like imagine, like this allegory of Earth. You know, <clears throat> how do we know that Earth is not flat? Well, it's precisely because of the kind of photographic images that we can give provide ourselves by way of traversing in low orbit this planet. These photographs, each of them give only a sector of reality, of what you might call to be objectivity. But the thing is that once we integrate, once we sew these little photographs, of the Earth taken at the low orbit, we would say that Earth is a round object. So that's how I imagine pluralism. It's what you might call to be different individual photographs or propositions about different sectors of reality that ought to be integrated according to the scientific method. And this scientific method is scientific only in so far as the method is very explicit. It can be challenged, unlike the philosophy, which are implicit. Oh, so, so you're a much more of a Piercean in that sense, then? This, I, I would say so. I would say yeah. so. I would okay. say so. Yes. Okay, shall we have a break? and then reconvene in five minutes. Sounds yeah, good. Yeah, sure, absolutely. All right, see everyone in five. Go take your cigarettes. <laughs> <laughs> Adio for now. I haven't eaten yet. It's bigger than <laughs>
Any question before we restart? Artem? I'm exhausted from the conference. I don't have any questions. <laughs> uh, oh, I, 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 oh, okay. I, sorry. I think I lost my lighter. <laughs> but I, I really think that this class is fundamentally different than our previous classes precisely because there are such a diverse kinds of people. That's the best. I mean, if a class doesn't have challenge and different voices and opinions, it's not a really good class. If you don't have heckling, it's not a good class. Hey, just not to waste time. Does is anyone hear this? I yeah. can hear you absolutely. Okay, good. Shall we start, Phil? That sounds great. OK. So let us begin the class. Uh, we are going, this session, as I said, is going to be mere introduction. And don't worry, we will <coughs> extend the length of the art class as far as you know we need. Uh, I, I will add, you know, sessions at the end if you haven't uh you know gone through the stuff that we were supposed to read and think about so let us start our session in earnest with a poparian question what is the difference between science and non-science or let me be more explicit. What is the difference between science, pseudoscience, or junk science? Who can start to talk about this before I start talking about this topic? I mean, you have, um, you know, this uh, empty appeals, you know, to science, you know, that you see, uh, you know, the, you know uh, we've talked about this before, but the, you know, the, the Neil deGrasse Tyson types, you know, <laughs> but, but, you know, then you also have, like, all sorts of, like, you know, mystical shaman type people who who just talk talking about the string theory yes yeah. i know that so, then, i've been in so many string theory conferences yeah. <laughs> I just, I, i'm fed up on this and then people can just like ramble like incoherent like string theory nonsense for like hours somehow and it's like how this isn't even thinking this is just words yes it's it's what you might call to be dogmatic philosophy worse than bad philosophy worse than if you think content of philosophy is bad let me enlighten you there is such a thing as bad philosophy that is even worse than philosophy
bad science is something that is actually quite dangerous. You see, no one really today, unfortunately, because of the liber, li, you know, this whole idea of the capitalist liberalism and, and the, the kind of infrastructure of thinking that has already been put there by capitalist system, people already have given up on philosophy. Philosophy is not taken seriously by anyone un unless those people who are actually very well committed to the duty of thinking and thinking better, okay? Science tries at this day to become and somehow fabricate a semblance of philosophy. It's, it's uh, what you might call to be its um, claims about truth, about objectivity, and so on and so forth. But then we see quite clearly, look at PopSci being broadcasted, particularly in America, in the name of science, you see that science is not anything other than a dogmatic, worst kind of dogmatic philosophy. It is in the service of neoliberalist thinking. It is in the service of the most dogmatic forms of thinking, which is also unconscious of what it actually does things. And this is, on all accounts, in opposition to how Einstein, Boltzmann, Newton, Darwin, Kepler, Copernicus, Galileo, and so many other people thought about science. So, thinking about philosophy of science as the consciousness of the science is not just a practice of philosophy. It is a practice that has political implications against the neoliberalist appropriation today, quite clearly. Thoughts, questions, before I move on board. I'm just... Um, <coughs> there's a, there's a, I open my door, Dad. Sorry. Okay. Oh, I was just going to say something about uh, Einstein. So like, there's this idea, you know, there. I guess there's a discussion lately about Einstein versus Poincaré and how there was sort of like a concerted effort, like almost like the philosophers were used as uh, PR or advertising to support an Einsteinian notion of time as a, as a, um, as, you know, uh, divisible into equal units against the sort of Poincaré notion of a dynamic view of time, whether or not this is the case, but it is this question of, again, of where, of where sort of the, where dogmatism begins, ends, and science begins. Yes, Pardon. yes, a very, very good um, question. You can see, I add something to that? Yes, absolutely, you can. Because you know, this is very true, you know, and if you, you know, look at, you know, the, the sciences and, you know, you look at real science and, you know, real logics, you know, they frequently do have this sort of like certain like implicit, like philosophical narratives, you know, which could or could not be caught up in certain biases. And, you know, I think I think it, the, the point that she made about, you know, um, uh, having, you know, philosophers do PR, you know, for the scientists is is, is true. And, you know, I think that what this shows is that, you know, there there is, can be some sort of philosophical dogmatism in, in real science. And 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 to carry things further, you, you, you need to be critical and diligent about that. You see, the thing is that neither philosophy nor philosophy are unbiased. We should completely rule out any form of thinking 
that purports itself to be an unbiased method or form of thinking. No, all forms of thinking, all they can do, insofar as we are really living in a concrete universe, is that they can mitigate human biases. Mitigation of human biases is not something that can achieve wholesale at the beginning. It's something that can only be achieved a step by step, baby step by baby step. And so are signs, for that matter. Now, uh, it, it, with regard to Meredith's question or Meredith's comments, is that you see at there is a reason that these earlier scientists had, in fact, conversation with philosophers. Uh, you see, Poincaré had conversation with Husserl. He had conversation with Oscar Becker, who was a student of Husserl, and it was a, also a great philosopher of mathematics. Both had conversations with the philosophers of his time. In fact, Boltzmann went to philosophy school. Went to philosophy school. He educated in philosophy. He, however, thought that the way that philosophers taught activity and the furniture of the real universe are not adequate. He was essentially what you might call to be disappointed by the philosopher's way of thinking about the world. Insofar as he thought that at that time, and yes, if you really think about it today, particularly within the content of philosophy, it also holds. He thought that philosophers' way of thinking about the world is fundamentally entangled with their subjective experience. But for Boltzmann, science was not an appendage of human subjective experience. Subjective experience can only give you a tiny aperture, a tiny access into the structure of the world. But if we are going to postulate what the structure of the world is, the universe is, and the idea that reality is in excess of the subject, then we should really understand how we can, step by step, critically, move away from our subjective experiential biases. So, yes, I think at the beginning, philosophers and scientists had a fundamentally fruitful conversation about all these matters, about the idea about objectivity, so on and so forth, but also about the most important aspect. And um, what is that? It's the idea that <clears throat> what you might call to be <clears throat> what does science does? What does in fact science does? Today we know that many theorists believe in that science, we can't, philosophy of science is extinguished or is passe, is antiquated, precisely because philosophy of science is not, is, it, it doesn't really give us any insight into the practical practice of science in laboratories and so on and so forth. <clears throat> they think that the practice of science is what is really important, but no, it is not. Boltzmann, Einstein, Kepler, Newton, all believed in the idea of science whose importance is predicated upon the fact of not its practice, but its explanatory powers. How many scientists today would you tell me can tell us about the explanation of the kind of 
mechanisms that undergird the kind of phenomenon they describe. They are no longer interested in understanding what explanation is or what the phenomenon under study is being explained by the explainants of the phenomenon. All they're interested in is that to make science work properly. As if doing the most optimal way of doing things. Just because science works doesn't, that's just a dogmatic philosophy. That's just a dogmatic philosophy. The practice of science should always be coupled with ambition to explain things, to find the best explainants for the explanandum phenomenon which you are studying. Uh, can I ask a derivative question? You can. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, um, it's just when we're talking about science versus pseudoscience, I kind of think that emerged in my head is also what we consider like properly science. Because, and here I'm mostly thinking about like mathematics, because uh, when you, for example, read Peirce's works or just, you know, look at the history of mathematics, you get that. Well, a mathematician didn't really do that much. Some people gave him them data and he just practiced it. And that's the Persian uh, idea of this kind of pragmatism of mathematics. And it seems that it can be even argued that like mathematics properly became a science only kind of after Newton, only after calculus is invented that kind of bounded geometry yes. with everything. And so, yes. And, yes. And, and even contemporary- Not earlier, maybe, maybe, maybe. After Galileo, I think after Galileo, it became yeah, a science. Yes, uh, but like even uh, right now, uh, when we talk about in academia, for example, in STEM, well, first in sciences, but math is removed from the sciences, and it seems like yes, mathematics has been kind of removed specifically because it didn't have the explanatory power. That is, we have those kind of algebraic structures, but I mean who can tell you like that how to apply a linear algebra other than to solve like or finite calculus but um it seems that it did gather some sort of a, an explanatory power but i wanted to ask you what's kind of your opinion on those disciplines that seem to provide tools but kind of maybe no straightforward applications because it seems that would a bit remove it from sciences and like that would inquire also into the fact like, is it scientific to inquire into foundations of mathematics? Does foundations of mathematics uh, uh, impact anything? Of course, like something like it was incompleteness theorem uh, paved the way for contemporary computation, yet in general, like uh, would a scientist, would a philosophy of science say that, well, those talks about whether uh, Termelo Frankel said theory or not is the valid foundation is kind of, you know, out of the way. It's useless. Yes. You see, the thing is that <clears throat> I think, to be honest with you, the more I have looked into the history of math and science is that I think the disjunction between mathematics and what you might call to be exact sciences is something that needs to be blamed on both parties, both absolutely, mathematicians yeah. and both scientists. Absolutely. I mean, uh, the thing is that moved at each other. They, 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 they simply try to say that, uh, you know, mathematical Mandel, he was such a great man. Mathematician. He contributed to the field of epistemology, computation, whatever you call it. But it is famous. After he came to the U.S., uh, um, he was uh, chasing Einstein in the corridors of Princeton, 
was telling him every morning that I have this recipe for a time machine, which I have postulated through my mathematical discipline. He really thought that mathematics is real, like almost Pythagoreans. That, math that basically whatever math is, is postulated in the field of mathematics has a counterpart in sensible reality. He was a player. The point that Einstein, to the point that Einstein was said that I do not fucking want to see the face of this guy one more time. I'm just sick of this person. <laughs> he was really like sick of Godel chasing him and trying to sell him the stuff. The thing is that you see, <clears throat> this all comes to the idea that what is the status of mathematics with regard to sciences? I think philosophy and mathematics has shed light onto it, but not sufficient, precisely because this is not something that you might call to be a clear-cut position or which we have already a fundamental knowledge. No, I would say that the minimum thing that we can go on for is like a Platonic position. <clears throat> and by the way, uh, you know, Plato usually in, in canonical interpretation, he, he is thought as a Pythagorean in the sense that he thinks that mathematicals are real. Namely, for every mathematical structure, there is a counterpart in the sensible reality. But no, this is absolutely not what Plato ever said. Plato never said such a thing, and I would you know, challenge any person who would say that Plato said something like that. No, all Plato says is that mathematics is important precisely because of its epistemological import. What is this epistemological import? If we think that reality is unstructured and only the powers of mind can structure it, namely the intelligibility of the objective is something not is given, but something that is being constructed, for us to think mathematics can structure reality. This is a fundamental question to which, unfortunately, I have no conclusive answer. Reza, I think we just uh, lost your signal for a little bit. Could you repeat the, the question to which you have no conclusive answer? <laughs> yes, I, 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 was, I was saying that uh, the point is that Plato thinks about mathematicals in terms of their epistemological status, in the sense that the structures are projected onto reality and we enrich reality by the structures of the mind, precisely because there is no such a thing as a given reality. Any person who thinks that there is such a thing as a given reality is following the logic of illusions. But then this, not, this does not answer the fundamental question that under what conditions and why should we take mathematics as the most efficient and efficacious way of structuring the furniture of the world. Unfortunately, as I said, I do not have a conclusive answer to this question. The correspondence between mathematics Oops. and physical reality is far from obvious. Any person who would say that they have thought about it is going to gerrymander the conclusions. I really do not. I mean, you have been in my math class, you have been in my Plato and Kant class. I really don't think that at this point, we can conclusively answer this question, unfortunately. It's part of what you might call to be 
the consciousness of science of objectivity. And it is to the extent that it is a fundamental aspect of how we do physics, how we do engineering, so on and so forth. Yes, it is extremely important. And I am so sorry that I don't have any answer. I am just a philosopher. I can only try to talk for so long, but you see the whole point about such questions that they can never be answered by whether scientists or philosophers. They required coordinated research by a community of people. And I think Cohn was right on this front. Cohn, Thomas Cohn was thinking that, you see, the whole point of what he calls normal science, and what is normal science for Cohn? So you, you, those of you, uh, we will talk about this in the next session when we, in earnest, start to look at the work of Cohn, Popper, and uh, Firebond. Um, we will we'll look at this in the sense that Cohen uh, had this idea that there are two different, at least two different paradigms of doing scientific work. What you might call to be normal science and what you might call to be revolutionary science. So what is normal science? Kuhn thinks of normal science as an enterprise of puzzle making. Imagine you are putting a jigsaw together. You, you can only think of knowledge of objectivity and the scientific accumulation of knowledge in terms of finding the best piece that you think that is going to hold up that can in the right most optimal way hang together with the piece that you have already posited this is what you might call so normal science from a kuhn's perspective is what you might call to be an accumulative sense of scientific enterprise in the sense that we are in the business of tinkering Science in the, in, the, in the normal paradigm is just a business of tinkering, like a jigsaw puzzle. We can only think about what at here and now hang together in the best possible way with what we have already posited, the theory that we have already posited. But there is also a different kind of paradigm that Kohn puts forward. It's called the revolutionary paradigm of science. The thing is that Kohn thinks, un unlike Popper, that the revolutionary paradigm of science is qualitatively different from the enterprise of normal science or puzzle making. In the sense that in the revolutionary paradigm of science, we posit a new theory, a fundamentally new theory. But, what I, but why fundamentally? It is fundamentally new theory in so far as not only it solves the problem of the old theory, but also addresses the kind of important anomalies or counterexamples that the old normal theory or normal doing of science failed to address. A good example is what you might call to be Newton versus Ptolemaic or even Copernican revolution. Not only it explains the phenomenon that they try to explain, but also it explains further phenomena that they could not explain in their own frameworks.
questions, challenges. Mind if you throw a bottle at me at this point? I have a question. Absolutely. Just, I would like you to go a little bit back to what you were saying um, when you were discussing what possibly proper science is or not. And you were talking about explanatory. I don't remember how you formulated it. Did you say from explanatory function of science? Yes. And you were saying, and you were saying so this is not my question. My question is like, you were saying that um, the bad part today about scientists is that they don't know or they don't want to know or they don't care about what explanation is. Yes. Yes. And somehow you also mentioned some words about politics, but then my connection was not really good. So I actually need that Sure, part. sure. I, 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 so I, yes. I would just I, want to say that within scientific discipline, practically, I don't see why you need to know what your explanation is if you're, if you're proposing a new theory or you already have a theory that explains new or old phenomena. Okay. So, what does it add to science? Yes. So it can fantastic a question. Superb question. Superb question. Really fantastic question. Okay, let me make this an uh, by way of example. First of all, uh, let me just go a little bit, if you lost the connection, and talk a little bit about a uh, labor of explanation. In the sense that, you see, uh, science uh, tries to uh, study target systems, namely phenomenon, under study. And of course, the phenomenon under study is not something that what you might call to be a real phenomenon. It's something that is archived by the powers of mind, by logic, by the labor of modeling, so on and so forth. First of all, let me make sure to tell you, and I have seen this put forward on so many occasions by so many philosophers, that data trumps rationalism. This is just bullshit. This is really a bullshit. First of all, there is no such a thing as pure or raw data. Every data in science or even in engineering is going to be mined, is going to be organized, is going to be framed by models. Models are theoretical entities, ultimately. So, you might say that there is no such a thing as a pure or raw empirical data. All of our data in science, in engineering, in whatever thing that you think, and no matter what kind of data we are talking about, is always going to be a product of models. That's actually a scary. It act what it does mean implicitly to the extent models can be distorted, our data can also be distorted. Our data about reality can be distorted, but so what? This is where science shine forth. Science is not something that simply extract some fundamental data from the structure of the universe and giving you as the stepping stone, no. Everything that science does take time. It is the labor of theorization and modeling, refinement and mining of the data, which are required for the testability, refutation, or corroboration of our most cherished theories. This is what theories are. We will talk about this when Popper makes a distinction between science and pseudoscience. That yes, I do believe that Popper, despite all of his prejudices, was right. What ultimately distinguishes science from pseudoscience is a testability criterion. Something that cannot be tested or falsified is not a scientific theory, is a pseudoscience. The more 
you can be refuted, the more scientific you can get. So this was the first thing, uh, the first. Now, <clears throat> repeat this. Oops, I think we just, I'm just gonna lower the bandwidth a little bit because we just lost you again. Can you hear me now, Reza? I can, I can hear you, I can hear you. I was uh, asking Svetlana that if she can pose the second part of her question. I, I, I vaguely remember it, but I, 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 I think I just went too off tangents. Um, I don't know which part now I have to... Uh, I think the part that you were talking about um, science and practice and whether they need to know about explanation or right. not. So my question was, it's very simple question. You said, so first I say that science, at least today, they don't know what explanation is. They're just happy with if they have an explanation. And you say that that's a, that could be a feature of bad science, or at least this is how I understand you saying. And it, it could be better or good if scientists knew what explanation is, yes, or what it yes. means to have an explanation, basically being a bit more philosophical. Thank you so <laughs> much. Oh, I, 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 I'm, I'm so sorry. I, I really, like sometimes I, 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 I forget quite... Uh, Hello, can anyone hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me, all of you? Yeah, I lost you for a second, but um, maybe it's just my connection, maybe. Please, Did please, anybody? everyone who loses I lost me, it as just... well, yeah. If people can... Uh, okay, okay, I'm, I'm just gonna... Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you now, Reza, but I'm, I'm just gonna tell people right now, if they can, uh, in the upper part of the Hangout, right next to where there's like a, a mic icon and a camera icon, there's an ascending bars icon. It sort of looks like a right triangle. If you can click on that and lower your bandwidth. Um, that might help with people's connections. Okay. Also, also you can always, uh, you know, just put a short note on the, on the sidebar that I don't hear you, I will disconnect if it is necessary, and we will, uh, you know, resume. Um, and I'm, I'm sorry for today, I, I'm just not feeling well um, because of the accident. I have to be down the stairs. Next time I will go next upstairs, which is close to the modem, and unfortunately we won't have such uh, difficulties. Anyway, so yes, Science is essentially coupled with the labor of explanation. Because science is not the study of the phenomenon at hand. It is the study of the phenomenon according to what has given reason to such phenomenon. Namely, it's explaining. Phenomenon is explanando, that which is to be explained. But the real point of science, I would say, is about explainants, those which explain. A good example is Boltzmann's work in, thermal, in, in thermodynamics. We know very well that Boltzmann drew his work on Maxwell, on Clausius, on Kelvin, on Carnot, Gibbs. 
all of these people prior to Boltzmann had simply given us a partial picture of what thermodynamics is. And by that, I mean thermal thermodynamics. So what is thermal thermodynamics? It's what you might call to be observable phenomena. Like, for example, you have this cylinder completely contained. Inside the cylinder, we have a compartment, a, 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 uh, a plate inside which there is implemented a trapdoor. So imagine, and this is what really observable or thermal thermodynamics is. So imagine about the second law of thermodynamics, the entropy. So in the, in the first compartment, with, inside the cylinder, we have a volume of gas, OK? And let's say that this gas is somehow colored, so we can observe it by, by naked eye. This is what you might call to be equilibrium position. Now imagine that the plate that compartmentalizes the cylinder has a trapdoor. We open this trapdoor. The gas starts to creep into the second compartment. This is what you call a scenario far from thermodynamic, far from equilibrium. In the sense that we are really genuinely dealing with a chaotic behavior of the gas, which is observable. Precisely because we are talking at this point about thermal thermodynamics, namely observable thermodynamical behaviors of a gas. Now, as we lift the strap door, the gas creeps into the second compartment. The process of filling the second compartment is what you might call to be far from equilibrium behaviors. What this chaotic behavior strives toward equilibrium behavior in the sense that gas ultimately feels the entire cylinder in a homogeneous manner, okay? This is what you might call to be equilibrium, this, the second equilibrial stage. The first equilibrial stage was in the first compartment. Then we opened the trapdoor far from the equilibrium. Then after a, a passage of the gas fills the end uniformly. This is what you might call to be equilibrium at the second stage. This is a thermal entropy. Scientists throughout ages since Carnot's engine, a steam engine, and Poincaré's idea of the Carnot's engine and the kind of mathematics that is required to solve such a problem, to Gibbs, to Maxwell, all of these people have simply tried to describe the phenomenon at hand. That what is actually happening? But no one ever really thought about what is, what are the parameters and the constraints that are behind such a phenomenon? These are what you might call anatory components or explainings of the said phenomenon. The explainings, the part of the explainings, and that's where the science comes through is that the explainers are not always within the field of our experience, our observable domain. Yes, we see the colored gas moving in such and such direction, having such and such a status at such and such time, 
But imagine if we go to a different scale where we are de dealing with atoms, particles, endowed with momentum, velocity, collision course, and energy points. At this point, we are no longer seeing this phenomenon in the way that we saw it in our thermal observable example. So this is exactly what Boltzmann does. He tries to explain why is that this phenomenon is being observed in such and such way that gases always move toward equilibrium. That there are such a thing as observable irreversible processes. Like as if once the gas moved out of the trapdoor, it can never come back inside the trapdoor. This is called an irreversible process. So this is, yes, the point is that, sure, science does not need to always talk about explanation, but the scientific enterprise as a whole is about explanation, is about the kind of mechanisms that are responsible for observations. Reza. Absolutely. I don't think I made myself clear. I was asking, but I agree that you have to strive to find an explanation. Yes. But I understood you saying that it was also important to know what it means for a physicist, for example, to know what explanation is, not the content of explanation, but rather the metaphysical, <laughs> I don't want to use this word, but uh, metaphysical explanation of what explanation is and what it means to have an explanation. I see. Mm. I saw that you're making this point that you, that physics or sciences are in poor state if they don't try to understand what they're doing. Is it, am I making myself yeah. clear? Y yes, yes, okay, yes. You see, uh, when I said that science, at least in the contemporary times, doesn't know what it does, it's precisely because what I, I simply meant, and uh, I, I, perhaps I went too far, and I am so sorry if I went too far. I simply meant that the, the emphasis of science today is just simply about the scientific method or the scientific practice, which is of the laboratory, right? Uh, what I meant is that the, 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 what you might call to be the global vision of science is not just about practice and method. It's also about explaining the phenomenon at hand. So by, by that, I do not mean that science should just simply becomes like Boltzmannian or Einsteinian or Newtonian kind of science that tries to always dig deeper, dig deeper and deeper, deeper, deeper. What I meant is that overconfidence in the scientific method can backfire. That's all I meant. Can backfire in what? We do not even know whether our methods are optimal or not, unless we test them against new explanatory phenomena. That's all I meant. This one. Uh, I'm a little bit unclear on on what an explanation would be or, or what even 
a scientific explanation is. I mean, it's it seems like something we we take for granted. So, like, if I'm boiling some water, I put it over my stove, it starts to boil. We could give a scientific explanation. We could say, you know, what's the boiling, or it's due to the molecules in the water. Um, but is this ever an explanation and, and not itself just a description, just a, a description of another kind? Well, so you to see, talk about the microscopic yes, happenings? Yes, uh, Adam, I think you are right on this point. You see, uh, the, 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 uh, I mean, first of all, you need to know that in the canonical philosophy of science, usually explanation and descriptions are being distinguished from one another. However, as you said, uh, there is a point at which the distinction between explanation and description fundamentally blurs. But at which point? You see, when we are talking about the thermal observable behaviors of a gas or a body of water that is being heated, we posit a different kind of entity responsible for such behavior, right? So we essentially describe such behaviors. We, we describe such molecular behaviors in terms of, for example, like Boltzmann, in terms of the statistical physics, namely the velocity, momentum, and energy of colliding particles in Brownian motion. So yes, this is a description, but it is not just any kind of description. It is a description that can shed light to the kind of phenomenon that we are described. And that's only description in that sense. And yes, from that perspective, uh, the, what you might call to be the fundamental division between description and explanation is blurred, is blurred. It's just simply that we have positive new kind of class of entities, properties and features of the system which explain the upper level, more observable behaviors of the system. So, so what exactly makes them uh, lower level, these entities? besides being, I guess, well, microscopic there are, there, are many, there are many ways that in, in today's philosophy of science or science, uh, these lower levels are being distinguished. One is a scale length. A scale length in physics, uh, let me just give you a very fun example put forward by philosopher of science, Mark Wilson. Imagine the amazing uh, shrinking man, like the old movie. Uh, so the amazing shrinking man is like this human who has a behavior at this kind of a scale then, you know, what you might call to be a human scale then. And then this human can also be shrunk to nano molecular level. The thing is that the behavior at the nanomolecular level is very different from the behavior at the level of the human behavior and what is observable. Imagine, this is a, 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 let, me, let me give you another example. Uh, engineers usually think about such things quite often. Engineers think out of um, a scale length or what you might call to be explanatory levels in terms of levels of manipulations. Imagine like a, a metal beam, okay? Uh, at the level of metal beam, we know that metal beam should, you know, uh, endure under such and such as stress, pressure, so on and so forth. These are just observable phenomena, okay? But then think of the metal beam at a different scale length. Like at a level of the crystal, crystal, crystallographic 
configuration of metal. At that level, we need more details. We need new formulas and mathematical models to explain why is that such separate crystals, metal crystals, can in fact form such uniform behaviors at the level of the observable metal bar. Okay? You can go even further at the atomic level. So this is this is one of one, one of the things, a scale. Another way is uh, how you might call to be uh, by way of modeling, in the sense that you see we can only predict such and such behaviors and such and such levels. But if we go to a lower level and lower level is distinguished by its predictability you know we can predict the behavior of a macroscopic metal beam far better at the level of the atomic nanoscale length of course this prediction is also very very difficult precisely because the amount of details that we are dealing with is just astonishing. It's far beyond the amount of details that we are dealing at the level of the microscopic metal beam. I really suggest you to uh, search and read this essay written by Carl Craver. It's called Levels, which precisely on this very problem. Craver, did you say? Carl Craver? So, so is it just a question of, of complexity? So, so the practical complexity of reducing certain things to microscopic behavior? So like social phenomena seem very difficult to understand by reducing them to microscopic uh, co composition. Um, but is the idea that in theory we could, but we're just practically unable at this point? Or do we think there's some like emergent structures at macroscopic levels that are like undecomposable? Yes, that's, that's a really fun. I mean, I, I, I didn't want to talk about this in our course, but, you know, insofar as this is just an introduction session, let's just talk about this. Engineers, I think, you see, I wish all philosophers had an engineering mentality. You see, engineers, usually in the colloquial sense, are thought as mindless and menial technicians. But believe me, engineers are not like that. Engineers think about the world like developers. So the thing is that usually when we are looking at a macroscopic level, that macroscopic level might have what you might call to be an intractable level of complexity in the sense that we cannot know we cannot conclude how we should approach the practice at this level. It's just too much fuzzy logic. It's just too much uh, basically blaring of boundaries of the given phenomenon. So what engineers do, oh, also, also by the way, so the microscopic has its own fuzzy boundaries and so on and so forth that makes it very, very hard to pin down in terms of practice. But so as the microscopic level. Microscopic level is not always a great way to start intervention with the system. In fact, hardly any engineer will touch a system at the microscopic atomic level because 
at the atomic or molecular level, we are dealing with such details that are just make our models computationally intractable. It just makes our practices infeasible. So both of these levels are just what you might call to be impractical. It's like you are trying to make a bridge. <clears throat> you see, at the level of making a bridge, you need to make, implement beams, cords, cables, so on and so forth. The phenomenon under which you observe the cord, the cable, and the metal beam are fuzzy. But so as the crystallographic scale of studying the metal nature. So what do engineers do in such situations? And that's what I would like, I would consider it as a paradigm for what you might call to be an engineering paradigm of political inter intervention. Engineers don't think about intervention at this or that level. They always think about what they call a mixed level understanding of a target system. In order for you to work with the messy problems of quantum physics or crystallographic metallurgical properties of metal beams, but also the fuzzy logic of the metal behavior at the microscopic level, you should find a new model. They call this model a mixed level model. It's essentially a kind of model that bridge the gap between lower level microscopic behaviors and upper level macroscopic behaviors. The way that they can do it is by way of something that they call approximation techniques. In physics, this is called simply renormalization groups or normalization techniques. Normalization techniques are what you might call to be in a way that you do not want to have just this or that, either this or that, but you want to have a view of this and a view of that at the same time. These are called approximation techniques, like bridges between the microscopic and the macroscopic in the most optimal way. So you can actually formulate coherently both about the microscopic messy problem of physics and the macroscopic fuzzy problems of experiential observation. Scientists do that all the time. But engineers are famous for that. Uh, basically, this is just what engineering is. Okay, uh, we are 22, 20, uh, 2.20. Let's have here questions. I, I, as I mentioned to you, don't get frustrated. This was just an introductory, introductory you know, session. We are going in earnest uh, a start next session with Popper uh, and Kuhn uh, about what science really is, the kind of theories of the nature of science that have been advanced um, since the beginning or the inception of the philosophy of science. And then, uh, unfortunately, as the time passes, things become more and more technical. I will make sure that if there is such a technicality, I will elaborate it. But if you think that it is something vague, you should always ask me the question to elaborate on this and, and, uh, and simplify it. 
but yes. So this was our first session, just, just like a rudimentary ideas and how we can think about such problems in a broader context. So if you have questions, please pose them. I have a few questions, but I would like other people also, because I, I think I speak, I ask a lot of questions, maybe other people. No, also. no, no, believe me. Uh, there is never enough questions, so, so go on. Okay, uh, one is a comment and another is a question uh, about sure. something you said earlier. Comment, like we had this little discussion about difference between the differences, the, the different kind of descriptions. And I think Adam asked a question about, uh, yeah, how is it that, th so the theoretical description is not a description. And then I was thinking that the difference between uh, different kind of descriptions, for example, subjective or literary description of a boiling water or even poetic description of a, of, of a boil, boiling water and explanation, description which is an explanation, is in how these different descriptions or statements are committed to a certain kind of theory a scientific theory or a model. Absolutely. I don't know. Um, so this is like a little maybe uh, addition to what we've discussed before. But my question was about something completely different. You were talking earlier about um, a certain integration of different... Um, you said that science is a refinement of methods of arriving to objectivity or something like that and and philosophy i think you implied a philosophy is a, is a space is a point where the integration of these different points of view on objectivity or objectivities somehow happens and i was wondering if you're talking about philosophy of science in this case or like philosophy in general <laughs> okay okay so with regard to your comment, yes, the idea of description and explanation is always theory laden. And uh, the whole point is that uh, as we, we look into the history of uh, philosophy of science, we see that the majority of the paradigms of philosophy of science are based on the idea that if a theory can accommodate the previous description within an explanatory, i.e. a new descriptive paradigm that explains not only the previous paradigm, what we have described from an observational point of view, but also something more at a deeper scale, then this would be a new theory exactly like Boltzmann, a statistical thermodynamics versus Clausius and Kelvin, thermal thermodynamics. So Boltzmann theory of a statistical thermodynamics just does not simply describe thermal thermodynamics as advanced by Clausius, Carnot, and Kelvin. It adds something else. It gives a description of a new kind of hypothetical entities, namely a statistical components, a statistical ensembles, which are basically a statistical ensembles of particles defined in terms of the boundary condition of the system, but also the velocity, their momentum, and their energy points. So this is, yet yeah, yes, this is a description, but this is not just another description. It is a description that can accommodate not only the previous description, but can explain any kind of behavior that arise from it. 
And I think Boltzmann, Boltzmann, a statistical law of thermodynamics, particularly the second law, is something what you might call to be, gets as close as to a universal law. I don't think that any person in the history of science, even Einstein, managed to really understand the nature of science in terms of how scientific explanation works. In the sense that we always work, we always start from the observational Raza, I think we lost you. Are you. Can you hear us at all? We might need you to repeat a couple minutes back. Yeah, I can't hear him either. Raza, I think. Can we, you hear me, Theo? I can hear you now. We lost about two minutes. Can you hear me? Yeah, can you hear me? Can you hear yes, me? Yes, yes. Sorry, I, I, I was saying that basically Boltzmann, I think Boltzmann uh, revolution in thermodynamics is even more important than Einstein within the context of the history of science, precisely because Boltzmann tries to understand that all of our observations, and we always only initiate from an observational point of view, precisely because we are limited beings, can be explained by non-observable entities. Thermal thermodynamics and its observable behaviors can be explained by a statistical thermodynamics or a statistical physics, by a statistical ensembles of particles having such and such velocities momentum and energy points. So this is my first uh, answer to uh, Svetlana's comment. As with regard to the question, I think that if I, if I answer this question right now, it might actually make more confusion than uh, resolution. Let's at least go to the next session and please do record your question and pose it at that point. Uh, precisely because I think that we, if I say something at this point, it might actually uh, put everyone, uh, throw everyone off. Uh, because some of the stuff that we are going to talk about, as I mentioned, uh, are are detailed and uh, they are not clear-cut manners. So please, please do record this question and pose it at the end of the second session. We when we at least okay. have gone through a little bit of details. Um, so I do not want to you know make make an answer that uh, requires just too many assumptions at this point. Okay, any, anyone else? I have some comments or uh about the question about explanatory power um, that I sort of wrote in the sidebar. Um, My apologies, Theo. I, 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 it's not that I don't want to read the sidebar, it's just I can't see it. <laughs> no, I, I, I totally understand. It, it can, you can get, uh, what do they call it, when there's too much information going up. In the, um, I'll just read what I said uh, in the sidebar. I said, what do we mean by explanatory? 
explanation of a theory or what exactly do we mean by explanatory power? What gives explanation power? Clarity or cohesion or simplicity or communicability? And what do we do about contradictory or exclusive explanations? And what makes a description, say, an utterly subjective one less powerful or efficient than a scientific explanation? If we are saying it is more efficient because of X, then are we acknowledging some sort of purpose of the said scientific explanation? And okay. Uh, one more thing to add to it is just um, who are explanations for? If explanations are for other scientists, um, then what fundamentally differs from other types of descriptions in other disciplines, say like explanations by um, non-scientists to non-scientists or, you know, the mystical to, or poetic to other poets or something like that? Well, first of all, uh, I mean, in answer to the first part of your question, explanation simply means the relation between explainance and the explanator. <clears throat> the re the, such a relation can be elaborated in different terms, in terms of invariances, in terms of uh, what you might call to be accommodation of assumptions. Like, okay, let me let me elaborate on these points. Like, we have a pole, a wooden pole, and this wooden pole casts a shadow on the wall. The shadow is the explanator. The position of the pole is the explainant. So you see, we always start with the explanator, that which ought to be explained, basically the phenomenon under a study, like the shadow cast on the wall by the pole. So how can we really shed light and what gave rise to this phenomenon, to this shadow? As we will, and this is premature for me to try to elaborate this, but all, all I can say that we will, throughout this course, go through different kinds of theories of scientific explanation. But one of the theories of explanation that has been put forward quite recently by James Woodward is the idea that <clears throat> explanation is what you might call to be invariance under a range of manipulations. As long as, so you imagine you move this pole to the left, to the right, you tilt it in different ways, but you do not simply annihilate the pole and replace it with something else. And that's what I meant by the constraints of the range of manipulation. As long as we do this, we notice that under all such manipulations, this pole will still cast a shadow on the wall. This is what James Woodward called a causal or explanatory invariance. So this is one. I will give you in the future sessions about the critique of Woodward's paradigm, and I will give you different alternative explanatory paradigms. As put forward by Hempel, by Putnam, and so on and so forth. But anyway, the whole point is that uh, for now, you can think about explanatory powers as variance under constraints of manipulation. As long as you do not change the gas molecules, of these gas molecules, with some liquid molecules or atoms,
when you go to the atomic scale, it should give you the explanatory powers over the observed phenomena. So this is one. Two, with regard to your second question, is that <clears throat> I think it is yet to be decided whether philosophy in general can shed light on the problem of explanation or it is philosophy of science. At this point, I, I can say, and this is completely It's part of a research, and I'm going to research. I will do not know the final answer. I would say that philosophy in general, unfortunately, cannot give you the paradigm of explanation. Only science and philosophy of science does. I think philosophy is just too vague and too general to shed light on, on these matters. Precisely because philosophy needs to be combined with experimentation. But does continental philosophy is combined with experimentation? I really would like you to answer me that. No, I really don't think so. Can, can one experiment with ideas themselves like could that be a form of experimentation in some sense or sure it's all... experimentation but 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 adam don't you think that this experimentation is what you might call to be an experimentation in the domain of ideas or where these ideas came from is an entirely different field that's the labor of explanation It's not that I'm saying that philosophy cannot, in principle, tell us anything about explanation. I, would, I, I just simply want to say that in its current instantiation, philosophy unfortunately does not have enough resources to adequately think about explanatory paradigms. That's all I'm saying. It's not that I'm saying that it is in principle cannot do it. I said that it can do it, but right now it doesn't have the resources. That's all. But what is philosophy supposed to explain with regards to those paradigms? Because it seems like scientists that which is doing those uh, explanatory moments, so is philosophy um, supposed to explain something else? That's another really fantastic question. You see, as we will go through these sessions, we notice that science has always implicit metaphysical assumptions. When scientists think that they don't have metaphysical assumptions, they are quite wrong. They are actually doing the bad job of philosophy. I think one of the great avenues that philosophy can actually not be an underdog of science, but a complement to science, is when it shed light on the metaphysical assumption of the scientific practice. Is an electron real or a metaphysical posit? No philosopher can, no, no, no scientist can answer you this at this moment, currently. I do really think that now Gracie Tyson or uh, Dawkins can answer you. No, they are going to whitewash it. Van Fressen will answer you. Sellars will answer you. Philosopher will answer you. That's, I think that is really a good thing. And that is precisely when science you see, the discipline of science and philosophy, these are just modes of thinking. They cannot be subordinated to one another. They should be thought as complementary. 
and so far as they are complementary, they should also be thought, like all other modes of thought, as essentially having their own biases. How can we mitigate the biases of this or that mode of thinking, science or philosophy or that matter? Well, by integration of all modes of thinking. When philosophy can shed light into the metaphysical assumptions of science, are we conscious? I'm not sure I'm understanding how like this non-biased thing is working in the integration between philosophy and sciences. And so you far see, as go ahead. you see, the, the thing is that when I'm saying non-biased, I do not mean that we are non-biased. Uh, like as if we are in some sort of innocent mode of thinking. You see, bias can only be mitigated. In fact, you want the bias in order to progress. But you need to also have a method of mitigation of biases. Science has its own biases. And I really do think that it does not have the adequate resources, as we will talk about, to mitigate its own observational and conceptual biases. It requires the hand of philosophy. And so philosophy requires the hand of science. So if I'm understanding you right, sorry for um, going too, on, too long about this, but so for, would you agree to say that bias exists in scientific practices? Is absolutely, the, absolutely, yes, absolutely. So, yeah, and so, so the metaphysical biases existing in pract scientific practice uh, renders uh, philosophical. So, how philosophy could add to this is by changing the philosophical practice imminent to scientific practice. Um, is that where you're kind of going? You might say that philosophy, at least, I mean, uh, I don't want to go too flash forward on this, but I would say that the only way, at least, I mean, for now, for now, uh, that you can think of philosophy as something as a critique of metaphysics or metaphysical implicit assumptions that are within the practice of science. And, and that's really an important thing. Precisely because when scientists think that they are simply doing the practice of science, they do not know how much their practice is actually being informed by their own metaphysical biases. This does not mean that a philosopher should tell them what to do. They can themselves be philosophers. They can themselves be philosophers. They can in themselves criticize their own metaphysical assumptions. I do not want to subordinate science to philosophy at all, nor philosophy to science. Reza, could you give an example of um, metaphysical bias of a scientist? Yes, I, I made a good uh, go to the string conference, the string theory conference, where the string field or, uh, or quantum field is actually talking as if it was real. Well, is it really real? No, what, what does that mean? You know, what, 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 the, what is a quantum field? Is it has the or just simply postulates models. This actually has fundamental consequences on the, on, the, on the progress of science, precisely because if you think that they are real, then you are going to, by way of the human bias, posit precisely such things as the ultimate furniture of the world beyond which you cannot see anything else. But if you think then as simply metaphysical posits, which can in fact be revised, then you are in the business of 
Boltzmannian or Einsteinian science. You explain it away. I had a quick question. Absolutely. I guess actually it's it's kind of turning turning it back to your court. Um, for me, it's easier to trudge through, through the trenches uh, of the history and philosophy of science when I have the relevance of the, of the contemporary debates, which is where I'm interested in and why I'm digging into the past. And I guess I was going to throw it back in your court and just ask you, and you can decline this, but you're at the end of the course after we've talked about all the details. What at the beginning, other than like, you know, getting lost in these little questions going sideways, are our big picture, I guess, issues that still exist today. For me, like you touched on today, maybe purse versus sellers and, and the idea of artificial intelligence and language and objectivity moving beyond empirical sort of uh, first person experience. Yes. I, I guess I'm interested to just ask you, like put yourself all the way at the end of the course and zoom all the way up to where you're at, at, at the moment, like five minutes, just lay out how you thread the needle of all those, all those things. So to set the stage to some degree, to go back and dig, dig again through the trenches. Sure. I don't know if uh, that made uh, sense. I would say, yes, no, no, that's, that's a good, that's, that's, that's a good one, but also a very, very difficult one. Uh, in the sense that, okay, let me, let me give you a brief uh, abstract of how we are moving forward. In the sense that I genuinely believe that science gives what you might call to be the complete picture of objectivity. By that, I do not mean that this objectivity is perfect. It can be revised, and that's precisely it is perfect picture of objectivity that cannot be revised is not objectivity, it's of the subject. So this is one. I think that only science can do that. I do not want, I, 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 I might be branded as a scientist uh, or, or a scientistic philosopher, but so be it. If that's what scientism is, I will wear it as a badge of honor. Two, despite the fact about the vocation of science and the scientific endeavor, there are uh, still many philosophical blind spots in the practice of science. To me, after I have read, you know, a lot of, and I am coming from a scientific tradition rather than philosophical tradition. I, I, uh, if you know this, if you already don't know, I don't have any formal philosophical education. I'm purely autodidactic in, on this front. For the last 25 years, I have taught myself philosophy. My real education is science. The thing is that, however, I think that philosophy can shed fundamental lights on the blindest parts of the scientific practice. And that's why I think philosophy of science should be taken seriously. Those people who say that science is just about practice and those philosophers who talk about scientific discipline and so on and so forth have no idea about what the practice of science entails, I would counter this challenge. I would say that those people who are only in the business of the practice of science do not know what science is. They are the unconscious menial technicians, like engineers. So I would like to gather this whole thing and I'm going to point out to all the kind of plot holes in the, in the, in the scientific enterprise, which are still open problem as we move forward, to show you that science 
in that respect, in that specific sense, is not that much different from philosophy. Just because it succeeds with its own discoveries doesn't mean that it is doing the right kind of thing. Accomplishment, pragmatic accomplishment, is not an index of truth. In the broadest possible way for truth. Should we finish it, Theo, at this point? I am being summoned to the garden work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's totally fine. And we, yeah, we went a little bit over today, but we also did it a little bit late. <clears throat> no, 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 it's, it's good. It's good. I mean, uh, uh, you, you, those of you who haven't been in my classes, we are going to take our time. Don't worry. If we never manage to finish it, we will add three sessions at the end. Uh, nevertheless, uh, I'm really a pleasure to have all of you here. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Um, I'll post the recording of this in the classroom. If you don't have access to the classroom for any reason, just um, feel free to send me an email or reach out to me on Facebook. I'll try and help you. Yes, in addition to Theo's, uh, I would say that, you know, I, I understand that, uh, you know, this is a class. And I understand that, like all classes, people usually feel coy or shy to pose their questions. But you can always pose your questions in the Google Classroom, and I will be happy to answer them. All right, last minute. Maybe logistical questions? Or I'll end the broadcast, and then if anyone else. Um, or, okay. Yeah, I can wait for the broadcast to end. Okay. All right, I'm going to end the podcast. Thank you, everyone.